Yo, what's up everyone? Welcome to the 2019 US NCO local exam states of matter section. Um, so this is going to be from questions thir uh, 13 through 18. Um, let's get started with question 13. Which gas at 600 Kelvin has the same effusion rate as methane CH4 at 150 Kelvin? So we're dealing with two gases here. The first gas, gas 1, uh, gas, gas 1. Let's say gas 1 is the methane. Um, so that's the methane, and methane is at 150 Kelvin. Gas 2 is our mystery gas. We don't know what gas 2 is. Gas 2, let's just say it's X, and we know that it's at uh, four, 600 Kelvin. Sorry. In order to figure out this question, we're going to need to use uh, Graham's law of effusion. Graham's law of effusion tells us that the rate of effusion, the rate of effusion of one gas over the rate of effusion of another gas is going to equal the molar mass of the second gas, the square root of the molar mass of the second gas over the molar mass of the first gas. Now, this version of the equation is not enough. And the reason this version is not enough is because this version assumes that both your gases are at the same temperature. And in this case, both your gases are not at the same temperature. So in order to uh, compensate for that, you need to add a T1 here and a T2 here, where T's, uh, the T's represent the temperatures. If you want to look at why the temperatures uh, or like how this equation is derived, you can look, you can, uh, look, in, look into the derivation. It uses the square root, um, square, mean, square mean velocity, what is it? Root mean square velocity um, formula. Um, and yeah, so this is what it's going to be. So we can use this to work through the algebra. We know that the rates of the gases, the rate of effusion of the gases are going to be the same. So R1, uh, R1 over R2 should be 1. Um, M2, we don't know M2. M2 was our mystery gas, so let's just say M2, uh, let's just leave it blank. T1 is going to be the first temperature, which is 150 Kelvin over M1 times T2. M1 is going to be the molar mass of CH3, which is 16 grams. Uh, or uh, times the molar mass, uh, sorry, times the temperature of the second gas, which is 600 Kelvin. Now we can uh, simplify this a little bit. We can square both sides um, and do a bit of simplification. So M2 over 16 grams times 4. Um, and so M2 comes out to uh, 64 grams. So this means that the molar mass of our mystery gas here is going to be 64 grams. Let's look at the answer choices. The only one with a molar mass of 64 is going to be answer choice C, which is silicon dioxide. And that was question 13. Let's go to question 14. Ammonia has a higher boiling point than its heavier uh, congeners uh, pH3 or ASH3. Um, what is the best explanation for this difference? Let's go through the answer choices to see which ones are wrong and which one is right. A, NH3 is trigonal, bi uh, trigonal pyramidal and polar, while pH3 and ASH3 are trigonal planar and nonpolar. Nitrogen, phosphorus, and arsenic are all in the same group. So when bonded with ammonia, sorry, when bonded with hydrogen, they're gonna all basically be the same. And that's because they have the same number of valence electrons. So A isn't really going to uh, mean anything. B, NH3 is much more acidic than pH3 or A, A, ASH3. That doesn't really have to do with the boiling point. The boiling point deals with intermolecular forces. Um, so we're trying to find what deals with intermolecular forces. C, NH3 experiences stronger London dispersion forces than pH3 or ASH3. Although this does deal with uh, intermolecular forces, this just isn't uh, true. London dispersion forces go up as you increase atomic number. Nitrogen has a smaller atomic number than phosphorus or arsenic. Therefore, it's not going to have stronger London dispersion forces. In fact, pH3 and ASH3 both face more London dispersion forces than nitrogen. So if uh, C can't be right, it must be D, but let's look into why. NH3 has extensive hydrogen bonding, while pH3 and ASH3 do not. Remember, hydrogen bonding was that special type of dipole-dipole interaction where you have hydrogen bonded to some uh, to one of three highly electronegative atoms, fluorine, oxygen, and nitrogen. In this case, we have nitrogen. Um, and the fact that you have a really electronegative atom 
and the fact that hydrogen is really small means that those interactions are really really strong um, and so you have uh, hydrogen bonding in NH3 but you don't have a really electronegative atom in pH3 or ASH3 therefore NH3 has more intermolecular forces and that's why it has a higher normal boiling point um, the answer for 14 is D let's go to 15 in which are the ionic solids ranked in order of increasing melting point so uh, all of these are just different orders of four um, molecules we have potassium bromide we have sodium chloride uh, sodium chloride we have sodium fluoride and we have magnesium oxide now these are all ionic solids me meaning that their uh, interactions are going to be purely coulombic and we can um, we can calculate the strength of their uh, interaction using Coulomb's law. Coulomb's law tells us that the force of attraction between two of these charged particles is going to be K times Q1, Q2 over R squared. K is some constant. Q1 and Q2 are the charges of the individual uh, ions that make up the compound. And R squared, R is going to be the distance between them. Um, so for all of these, we don't know K, we don't know R. We have to base this all entirely on Q1, Q2. If you calculate the Q1, Q2 values for all of these compounds, you'll realize something. Let's go through them. So potassium has a charge of plus one, bromide has a charge of minus one. So Q1, Q2 is going to be minus one. Um, and sodium chloride, if you do it, um, I guess I'll do it here. Um, that's going to be plus one times minus one. That is also minus one um, sodium fluoride it's going to be plus one minus one the difference is when you get to magnesium oxide magnesium has a charge of plus two oxygen has a charge of negative two so your q1 q2 value comes out to negative four this means that magnesium oxide faces more uh, f has a greater force of attraction uh, between the magnesium and the oxide meaning you have more intermolecular forces in the magnesium oxide compared to the other three molecules. So magnesium oxide should have the highest melting point. And the answer choice that best represents that is A. Um, a is the only one with magnesium oxide at, uh, as the uh, greatest uh, melting point. So the answer for, for, for 15 is A. Let's go to 16. A two-dimensional slice through a lattice of a crystalline solid containing two different elements, X and Y, are shown uh, schematically whoops that should be shown uh, schematically and to scale below what type of solid is it let's go through our answer choices a a metallic alloy such as uh, iron chrome cro uh, I don't know how to say that whatever um, iron and chromium are really really close to each other iron has a uh, has an atomic number of 26 and chromium has a uh, atomic number of 24 so these are really, really uh, similarly shaped atoms. This means that if they form an alloy, they're going to create a substitutional alloy. In a substitutional alloy, you just take one of the atoms, you just replace it with another one. Um, and so if that was the case, you would see a bunch of these, a uh, bunch of a certain type of atom kind of in order. If you had, um, if you were to alloy iron using chromium, you would have a bunch of irons and then you would take some of those irons and just replace them with chromium atoms. And that's not what we see here. Um, yeah, you don't have some substitution happening here. You have a uniform pattern um, consistently happening. So it can't be A. B, a molecular solid such as iodine bromide. This could be correct, yeah. Um, your atoms, your two atoms could be iodine and bromide. And you have these uh, molecules that are um, all around here. And you have intermolecular forces that connect them all together. So B could be correct. C, an ionic compound such as lithium chloride. If you had an ionic compound, you would have a lattice. And a lattice looks more like uh, this. So um, a, this is not what our diagram looks like. You just have this a bunch of times, over and over again. That's what a lattice looks like. Um, and so it, it can't be C, because if it were C, then you would have a lattice. D, a network uh, covalent solid, whoops, such as silicon carbide. That's also not true. If you had a network covalent solid, you would also have these kind of networks, these kind of lattice-like things, and you don't have that here. So D is not correct. B is the right answer for 16. Um, let's go to 17. 
A portion of the phase diagram of uranium hexafluoride is shown below. Which statements are correct? Um, we, we have UF6 sublimes at atmospheric pressure and at 80 degrees Celsius and 1.5 atmosphere, only uranium hexafluoride is pre present at equilibrium. So let's look at our phase diagram. You'll notice that our phase diagram isn't labeled. Um, so you have, to, you have to use your prior knowledge of a phase diagram. And uh, in a phase diagram, this section is gonna be the gas, this section is the solid, and this section is the liquid. Let's go through our answer choices again. A, UF6 sublimes at atmospheric temperature. For to sublime, it means to go from solid to gas in just one step. So can it sublime at atmospheric temperature? Atmospheric, uh, sorry, atmospheric pressure. Atmospheric pressure is one atmosphere, and at one atmosphere, you can go from solid to gas. Um, so one does check out, that's correct. Two, at 80, 80 degrees Celsius and 1.5 atmosphere, only UF6 uh, gas is present at equilibrium. At 1.5 atmosphere, that's about here. Let me do it in a different color. That's about here. Um, and 80 degrees Celsius is here, so we're dealing with about here. And yeah, at this point, you only have a gas. So two also makes sense. Therefore, your answer is C, both one and uh, two. So our answer for 17 is C. Let's go to the last question, which is 18. One unit cell of a crystal containing elements X, Y, and Z uh, is shown below what is its formula so we have a bunch of these atoms let's calculate them Our yeah uh, let's start with the X for X you have just one atom in the center and it's a center atom so one center atom counts for one each so you have one X atom um, let's calculate Y now Y um, so for Y Y's are all these corner atoms you have eight of them and remember, corner atoms uh, all represent one eighth of a total atom. So if you have eight of them and each of them represent one eighth, you have one Y atom. And let's calculate Z now. Now, Z is a bit different. Z is uh, a face um, atom. So you have six of these faces um, and these face atoms all represent one half each. So you have six of them and each of them represent one half. So you really have three Z atoms. So if you were to write out the full formula, it would look uh, like X, Y, Z, three, which is answer choice B. And that is the right answer. Um, and that was the 2019 uh, USNTO local exam states of matter section. I hope this was helpful. Um, uh, thank you for watching and I hope to see you later.